Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 127 for November 17, 2011. A peek inside the Peterson. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us this Thursday for Auto Line After Hours. We're doing something a little bit different. We had to come into LA for the LA Auto Show and we thought as long as we're in Los Angeles, why don't we do Auto Line After Hours here? Unfortunately, my co-pilot Peter DeLorenzo is not with us tonight, so I can't wait to get back to be with Peter again. But speaking of Peter, we're at the Peterson Automotive Museum, one of the best museums in the world. Come on inside, we're gonna take you on a walking tour. We're gonna have a, some great conversation here and we'll get into the rapid fire part of the show as we always do at the end. But right now, come on in, let's go inside the Peterson. Okay, first thing that we gotta do is talk about the car that they've got in the lobby right here. This is the Edsel Ford Roadster, something that Edsel Ford, so Henry Ford, built for himself. He had his designers craft this thing. It's a beautiful roadster. And it had sort of disappeared for a while. They found it. They got it kind of restored. But it was this kind of fire engine red uh, paint job that they did to it. Now it's got this beautiful charcoal gray look to it. And it's just a, a spectacular automobile. Extremely rare. And it's just really cool that it's the first thing that they have here in the museum. We're talking about it right now because they're actually going to move it from the museum to the LA Auto Show. And if we save it for later in the show to talk about this thing, will probably not be here. But just a very elegant car. stuck in the mud uh, that that has to be manhandled out and of course we're looking at a very early american uh, this is an american car this is actually called american the 1911 american underslung really really large wheels and a frame that actually hung under the wheels which is why they needed to be so big for to get back that ground clearance but i love like you say you've got this diorama of it stuck in the mud, which of course was a very common occurrence back in its day. There were not paved roads everywhere. <laughs> there, there most certainly were not. And there weren't car manufacturers everywhere. Uh, sometimes you had to make your own. In fact, that's some of the, the banging and clanging that we hear in the background is you got this beautiful old barn jam-packed with all kinds of tools. It looks more like a, uh, a blacksmith's shop. Well, that's because what it is. It's it's a blacksmith's <laughs> shop. And, you know, that's where, uh, that's the first people that made cars a lot of times. And what's the, the car? You've got a quadricycle kind of vehicle with a tiller steering yeah, to it. Yeah, it's a, that's, that's a, a, a great description for it. It's, it's actually a 1900 Breer, Whoa. built by Carl Breer, a gentleman that ended up working for Chrysler and becoming very, very influential in, the, in their engineering department. But this is a steam car he built in his youth. Wow. 
Wow. It, and it, it still runs. It's, it's really <laughs> extraordinary. Even more impressive. Yeah. And, and I like what you're doing here, putting things in context. Like you say, it's not just cars on a car. Right. You, you could go to any museum and see that, but we want to show people how cars interact. Mm -hmm. how and car of course, being in Los Angeles, there's a heavy California influence to everything that you're exhibiting here. You're absolutely right. We talk a lot about LA. It's where we are. It's just the capital of car culture. Detroit may be the capital of car production, but yeah. we're the capital of car <laughs> consumption. It's true. It is true. And there used to be a lot of racetracks in LA when land wasn't as valuable as it is today. And about the only way they could get a reliably smooth surface was to make it out of wood. So we're looking at a diorama right now of a, a Stutz Bearcat. Is this no? It was like they call it a white squadron racer, obviously, because of the color, but this this car, it, it uses a very unique engine. It's very, very advanced for the day, and what wasn't so advanced was the surface on which it ran. Again, it just, just boards right. put together. And these were oval tracks. There were oval tracks. Some were circular, uh, but they all were eventually got saturated with grease, and sometimes the, the boards would pop loose and come up and injure drivers, and sometimes they would just catch on fire. And then they figured out a way to get a banked surface without having to yeah. resort to wood and yeah. good and, thing because it's a bad day when your racetrack burns down. It's not a good you're not having a good day <laughs> if that happens. Not having a good day. And kind of a break from the from the uh, chronology as we walk through the museum here and look at different displays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. is is this section here. We've got we've got uh, about 30 different dioramas on the on the first floor and this is the first of 3 that aren't don't really relate chronologically but we want to show things that that, that people can see that are interesting and that help give the rest of it context. And right now we've got three home-built two-seater sports cars. And, and you, you say home-built, but man, these things are beautifully turned they out. They are, and that just gives you an idea of the creativity and the passion that these people brought to their their everything that they did. Uh -huh. And you know, you have high school kids working on cars using brand new fiberglass material. You've got a race car driver who who designed the chassis with chalk on the garage floor. Yeah, and, and we're talking about cars that were built 60 years ago or better. Yes. So yes. when you mentioned fiberglass, that would have been, you know, very exotic. Fiberglass was revolutionary. It was, let's, it's the early equivalent of carbon fiber today. <laughs> Only a lot less expensive and a lot easier to yeah, work. You don't need an autoclave to, to work no, in fiberglass. No autoclave needed. <laughs> Just patience. And here you're, uh, we're looking at another diorama with uh, an early bungalow, right? Yeah, uh, this is this is bungalow. Home. This it's somebody's house. It's it's really popular architectural style in Los Angeles today. But this would have been very different this back in the been, day. See, we're 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 putting people back in the 20s, and a lot of people built built um, uh, developments and things like that using this kind of style. Uh, the craftsman style, bungalow style, became very very popular. And and what people were also starting to do was building garages mm -hmm. so they could put the cars in because cars were becoming really, really important. Uh, in L.A., then as now, you were nothing if you didn't have a car. If you couldn't get around, forget about it. <laughs> and the idea was to put your car in the garage, and that would protect it overnight. And here you've got a giant, giant billboard because people, you know, they're going faster and faster. Cars are getting more and more powerful. Roads are getting better. So you want people to catch people's eye as they go by. So you have to have gigantic you billboards. You have to have gigantic billboards. So this would have never been in place in the 19th century, you, would it? No. You, you, this you is would. a Never have seen something like this. Not along a road. You and and never it's because you're going fast. I never thought of that. And because before. you're going fast, and also because you're going fast, you got to worry about this guy. Yeah. And what Leslie's referring to is they've got as part of this diorama, uh, California Highway Patrolman in what, 1930-ish something yeah. Harley Davidson. You got it. It's a 1932 Harley. We have a California Highway Patrol. Very, very early bike. Perfectly restored and correctly restored. Very unusual to find one like this. And you've got this Highway Patrol. Patrolman, this 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 accurate mannequin, uh, looking around the billboard, just waiting for you to come by, going a little too fast, and then I guess it's thirty days or thirty dollars. Uh, and then we we walk down the street some more, and on our right we've got a gas station from the 1930s and marvelous Spanish architecture, which just suited the day so perfectly. And also, if you look on the other side, if you look to your left as you're walking, we have Powell Motor Company, and this is a diorama of a life-size car dealership 
of the 30s or 40s. Right now we feature 1941 Cadillac, but this can be anything. When we opened it was Auburn and Cord, and who knows what it'll be next. It's, uh -huh. been, it's been 30 or 40 different things. So you, you want to capture the flavor of what it was like shopping for a car back in the 30s. Yes, it's exactly, exactly. We want to show people that it was really like walking into a salon. It was an experience to celebrate. Um, there were fine draperies, there were fine fabrics. You walked on Persian rugs a lot of times, and it was it was it was a really big event when you went in to, to buy a car. It's interesting because you know all the high-end marks today have very elaborate dealerships. So I mean, this is nothing new. This know? is nothing new. I think maybe they're even partially inspired by something like this. Oh, they've got to be sure because when you're dealing with a higher-end clientele, it's the whole shopping That's experience. Right. Well, right? and when you were selling 1941 Cadillacs, they were a lot of money. Even in 1941, they were always a luxury oh, yeah. car. Always very important. Right. And for the same reason, this is a little diverse for the same reason that we had a billboard is the reason that we have this guy. Now this, describe this. What are we looking at This here? is the dog diner. Now, what we should tell everybody is we're looking at a gigantic sized dog, a bulldog with a pipe in his mouth with smoke coming out of the pipe, and he's got to be what? 20, 30 feet tall Probably or something like that? Probably 20 feet tall at least, and he's got a pipe coming out of his mouth with live smoke like you just said. But it's a building. And between his feet is a door you can walk through. And you can get ice cream, you can get a tamale. And the whole idea, just like the billboard, is you have to capture people's attention. And Southern California had an unusually large number of this kind of mimetic architecture and kind of became known for that. And mimetic being that it, it mimics something. It mimics, in this case, it mimics a dog. Exactly. It mimics something in life. It could be a dog. It could be, it could be any giant tea kettle. You name it. And we've seen, you know, like motels. We've all seen the pictures of the tea. TPs, you know, uh, exactly. where you could go and exactly. stay in a TP, and, and you got to believe that kids were telling their dad, 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 stop! I want to get ice cream in the dog. You know it. You know it. <laughs> and, and and anything to get to get a leg up, anything to get attention, mm -hmm. was was what you needed. Uh -huh. What we have here is something that uh, people think that strip malls are a modern invention. Well, they're not. They came, they came about in the 1930s. The idea of a strip mall, before the storefront was right along the sidewalk, and they figured that that was enough. Was it when you're walking by, you had a horse or something, that was not a problem. But what the strip mall did was they took the building and they moved it back on the property and they gave what used to be the most expensive land over to the car because they reasoned that if you could accommodate vehicles, pardon me, if you couldn't accommodate customers traveling by car, you weren't going to have any customers and and no business. So the first strip mall actually started in California. The very first strip mall is in California and it is a walking distance from the Peterson Museum. It is still there. It's not a strip mall. Appropriately enough, it's a Porsche dealer. <laughs> It's uh, unbelievable that uh, the original strip mall is now a car dealership. Well, it just seems it's so perfect for L.A. <laughs> what could be more L.A.? <laughs> what could be more L.A.? And then, and then you end up, you know, we, we take people, again, through the chronology of auto automobile development and the development of Los Angeles, we get into the post-war era. Mm -hmm. And people have to remember that there are an awful lot of returning servicemen coming back from Europe and elsewhere with a lot of new experiences. They have a lot of new skills, and they're anxious to put those skills to use improving their cars. They improve them for performance and by building hot rods, or they improve them for appearance by building customs. So and we mm -hmm. have examples of a hot rod shop. We have example of a customizing shop. And we also have an example <laughs> pretty high profile example of a drive up diner. Exactly the kind of 1950s Jetson like googie architecture, lots of spans of glass, colorful interior, lights were always on, and it was, again, it was attracting your attention. Look at all these people in here eating this great food, having a great time. It's warm, it's comfortable, or on a hot day, it's cool and comfortable, and it just, just becomes very, very inviting. And it became, again, a, a uniquely Southern California, and it, the design was propagated all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And I love how it looks so retro in the picture there, and yet in its day it must have been very modern. That was as modern as tomorrow in, in the <laughs> 1950s. It was it was like the, the Jetson Mobile landed. I mean, there's so much that we can talk about here. We can only hit some of the highlights. There's all kinds of dioramas, all kinds of cars, and things related to cars that we're walking by right now that I just think is really helps put the car in a context. Well, you're right. We want to tell the full story. You want to talk about 
about the car. We want to talk about design in Los Angeles, how, how a, most of what's important today comes from L.A. Most of the designs car, come from people at, uh, at, for example, Art Center College of Design right, that end is. up going to work for the major car companies. Uh -huh. We talk about safety. Uh -huh. It's all fun, but you have to be a little bit realistic about it. Right. And we also talk about the future of the automobile. We're not exactly sure what the future is going to be. It could be a, it could be a solar powered car like this goofy thing, yeah. or it, it could be anything. But right. And when he says this goofy thing, it's a it's a solar powered car with these gigantic. So it almost looks like a, I don't know a hood or a, well, this like, is, a it, bonnet or something. Well, it kind on, of is. On it's, it's, on the the car. It, it's like a car with it that carries around its own covered in vo photovoltaic well, it's cells. Like, yeah, covered, it's like it carries around its own tunnel. Uh -huh. And the idea was this is actually a hybrid. It is a solar electric wind powered hybrid because that's a sail. The idea was was that the wind would help move you along. Oh so on a dark God. day that was that there was no breeze, you were in trouble. Yeah. But on a sunny day with a good stiff wind, you could really make tracks. Unbelievable. And it's this very bullet-shaped kind of vehicle. Very, you know, almost looks like a land speed racer with this, this big wraparound uh, photovoltaic sign. Well, the idea behind these solar power cars was to get them as lightweight as possible and as aerodynamic as possible. So you wanted to, you wanted to lengthen the front and, and reduce the uh, uh, the frontal area as much as possible. Hey, there's an escalator right here. Let's jump on this because I know you got some good things upstairs. Oh, yeah, and, uh, we can upstairs. only hit one of the highlights on that because there's just so much to see here. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about the building is even historical. The building even relates to cars because it's it, it's at the very end of the world's first linear shopping district, which actually was designed around the automobile. This this Wilshire Boulevard wouldn't have its current shape if it wasn't for the car. Because everything had to be built around providing access for people. Exactly and, and, and right. And parking, especially, exactly. right? Parking. parking was around the back. You, you found a store you wanted to go in, uh -huh. then you went around the back and you parked. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking... We're, would be the best here. Maybe, should we go look at the scooters that you've got here? Because, yeah. What? Why don't we go that way? Yeah, let's go look at the scooters. I mean, there's just so much to look at here. Scooters and motorcycles. We've got scooters, we've got motorcycles, we have alternative power, supercars, you name it. We try to cover everything. There's an awful lot of stories Anything to tell. Anything that's motorized, uh, anything that's transportation. Motorized, anything that's important to the motoring landscape in Los Angeles. But a lot of people today find the scooters are about the most viable solution to their transportation problems. They're really inexpensive. They're fairly cheap to insure. They use very, very little gas, and they're, and they're very chic. Yeah, yeah. It's very chic now to, to ride a scooter. And you can park them just about anywhere. You can too. park them anywhere. You can bring them in the house if you needed to, <laughs> if you really needed to. And what's amazing as I gaze around this exhibit that you've got here is the un unbelievable variety of colors and shapes and forms. Uh, it's just extraordinary what you can do with two little wheels and a tiny <laughs> engine. It's, it's utterly amazing, and it shows the inventiveness at work. You know, people, there's so many solutions to these problems but, of but, and, transportation. And we're in on one of them because this blows me away. This has got to be the first scooter, more or less. 1917 is this what is this a, says. Y y exactly right. This is a 1917 scooter. These were actually introduced in 1915 and is the world's first practical scooter. It has two tiny little wheels. It's got a platform on which you stand. Uh, later, they were available with seats. You push the handlebar forward to go. You pull it back to stop. And the engine is actually built uh, integrally with the front hub. It's a very Unreal. interesting way to do it. It's a nice compact um, assembly. And it says that it's an autoped. Is that what they call those things? They were called autopeds. Yep. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> what, that's when what when they did the term them. scooter come around? You know? Well, this term, that's a really good question. I don't think anybody knows exactly, but the, the scooters were derived from children's toys, and they called those scooters. Uh -huh. So you have the push kick toys. Uh -huh. and, and, and scooters share, modern scooters, even back to 17, they share an awful lot of architecture with the, with the children's toys. Unbelievable variety here, too. Here's oh. another one that I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. It looks like a, a military scooter from World War II. Well, you a good eye because that's exactly what it is. This is called a Cushman Airborne. The idea with this scooter was to drop it by parachute from an airplane so that the, the GIs on the ground would have something to scoot around in. And frankly, not many of these survived because when you were done getting where you needed to go, you just left it. You were, you were worried about this. You were worried about the enemy yeah, yeah. and getting and getting to someplace safe and, and taking care of business. How do you put a collection like this together? Because, again, 
if you don't see this, you can't appreciate the tremendous amount of variety of styles and different kinds of scooters there are here. Well, we have a couple of approaches. Um, we like to show people what they expect to see. When somebody comes to see a scooter exhibit, they're expecting to see Vespas. They're expecting right. to see Lambrettas. That's, that's what I thought they're expecting see, right? to see Cushmans. But we also want to show people that, yeah, there are those things. But there's really interesting varieties of those things, like the postal van oh right here. Gosh. Based oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Right. <laughs> based on a, 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 a Lambretta. But there are also really kooky things, like Carly Davidson made a scooter called the Topper. There was a company <laughs> that made a scooter that was just for carrying golf clubs. <laughs> you could have scooters that fold it up. Uh, it's, it's and, just and here's amazing. one that fits in a suitcase. And here's too. one that fits in the suitcase. The world's smallest scooter. World's smallest scooter. You, you fold up the handlebars. You fold up the foot pegs. You put it in your suitcase. I think you'd have trouble getting it through, through uh, security, these <laughs> security days at the airport, at the airport right. right now. But uh, back then, I don't think <laughs> that, that was as. I, I, I'm sure sure they see a lot of weird things. I'll bet they've never seen that. My hunch is they never have <laughs> and probably won't for some time. So again, how do you go about collecting these things? How do you even know what to collect? How do you go out and find them? Well, we keep an active list of people who offer things to us. We There are a lot of collectors in Los Angeles. Because remember, L.A., you can drive cars year-round, so mm -hmm. people have cars, and they do drive them year-round, and they have garages full of them. It's just wonderful how many collectors are here. And sometimes we have to go to other parts of the country, but people People, you know, very freely Pretty much you can loan us find their what things. You need here, huh? Yeah, we've got a wonderful collection of our own. We have a collection of about 350 vehicles, uh -huh. and we a lot of these scooters are from our own collection. But those that aren't, we we borrowed. Like this example, this is a wonderful example. This is actually the only case that I know of where a vehicle came as an optional extra for another vehicle. <laughs> this is this was never sold in America, but it was sold. We're looking uh, at what? Uh, uh, we're looking Honda? at a Honda City. It's called a Honda City, and it, it looks like it looks like a Civic that's somebody left in the dryer too long because it's very, very small, but it comes with a tiny fold up what they call a motocompo, but it's really a scooter in the back. And you, you, what you, you just do, flip up the hatch. On. You flip up the hatch. You pull out the scooter. You unfold it. You get on it, and you drive away. What what year is this, more or less? This is a, this is the early '80s. And what and what and what you do? You went as far as you could with the car, mm -hmm. and then once you reached the limit, you got in your scooter, and uh, and and went the went the rest of the distance. That's pretty wild. I, I, I remember seeing pictures of that, but I've never actually seen one before. Yeah. Well, you won't. This is probably the only one in America. Wow. Probably, they're very, very rare mm -hmm. in America because they're very popular in Japan and, and, and other areas. Mm -hmm. You know, not only do we talk about the chronology of scooters, but you know we are LA centric. We, we we like to talk about what's been going on in our own backyard, and scooters are a really important part of Los Angeles manufacturing history. There are so many scooters. I built, had no idea. I never built knew in that. LA. Most people don't. Uh, a lot of them. But you you had Powell, you had you had Salisbury, you had Motorglide, you got, you had all different kinds of things, and and variations too. Like I had these these kooky delivery vehicles, and these are all what 1940s ish. Yeah, this this car here is a 1950. They call it a car. It's a tri car, mm -hmm. uh, which is Salisbury's delivery vehicle. And you've got these bad boys right here, <laughs> the Salisbury Model 85 Deluxe mm -hmm. and the Model 85 Regular. This is kind of the holy grail for scooter aficionados because they're so sleek, they're so they're so futuristic looking. Futuristic in an Art Deco kind of a way. In an Art Deco way, and and they're and they're impossibly orange. So picture, <laughs> pi yes, if, they are. If you have a scooter with with that that has a full fairing on it, the, the engine fully enclosed in sheet metal, and you've got what amounts to a chair to sit on. It's mm -hmm. actually a pretty comfortable way to go. And they're really cool looking. You almost wonder why nobody's revived this kind of approach. To doing a scooter. Uh, they may yet. I think oh, yeah. people, you know what, people seem to borrow inspiration from every generation. And and who knows, maybe somebody will turn back and say, you know what, that sounds very, pretty cool. Maybe yeah. we should try that again. Yeah, no doubt. Um, we talk about okay. also, just, just to wrap it up, we talk about Vespas, which, uh, you know, you can't have a scooter exhibit and not focus in on Vespas. So we have like, an entire section just mm -hmm. devoted to Vespa. We have a Vespa Woody. Most people have no idea it was out there, but they were actually marketed in America as an alternative to station wagons. And it, 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 it's really like uh, a comfortable seat it's, that would seat at least two people very comfortably with a wood body around it and a fabric cover to it. And a big old fabric canopy and it lo looks like a little motorized rickshaw. It does. In a, in a way. It, in a kind of a kind of a pale metallic green. It's, it's 
it's very, very rare. Very uh, rare. I would point to say, I mean, to me, this, my mind would say this is something that you would see in India or something like that, but, but it's from here. Well, they tried everything in America. They tried, you know, even the Soviet Union in the 50s tried to market cars in America. They thought, well, this is where the money is. Why not try to get some of it? So, <laughs> so that's what they did. Get your money from the capitalists, of course. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so and we've got oh, the Hot Wheels okay, exhibition that I we got to take a look at. Want to be sure and point this out? Yeah, you've this got is, Hot Wheels. You've got all kinds of Hot Wheel cars. All kinds toys. of Hot Wheel cars. We have toys, and we show kids that you know Hot Wheels. They come from someplace. They have to be designed. They have to be built. Uh, fortunately, the designers don't have to worry too much about uh, ergonomics and things because nobody's going to get into them. But, but it's interesting for kids to see where their little toys come from, to see that, that they are engineered and they are designed, and that maybe when they grow up, they can help design them. And you've got to add, designed here in Los Angeles. Designed here in Los Angeles. The most popular manufacturer in the world of cars is based right here in L.A. It's called Mattel. <laughs> see, that's pretty cool. Again, I mean, I knew, of course, that these cars had to be designed and all that. I had no idea the Hot Wheels cars were done in L.A. Absolutely right. Designed, designed right here in Los Angeles. Angeles. Uh, again, this is where a lot of the inspiration is. This, a lot of the customs are here. And this, this is where you see these things on the street more than anywhere else. It's very unusual to see a custom in, for example, Chicago or someplace, uh -huh. especially this time of year. Right. So, Leslie, how do you come up with ideas of what you want in the museum and how you want to exhibit them? Well, we, we look at our, our mission, which is to explore and present the history of the automobile and its impact on our life and culture um, with an emphasis on Los Angeles. So, anything that overlaps into that into that is what we want to talk about. We want mm -hmm. to talk about, of course, racing. And we have a whole corridor of the museum devoted to racing and performance. Uh, we've got the Bruce Meyer Gallery, which is de normally devoted to hot rods, but right now it has a special exhibition on Phil Hill. Because Phil Hill just passed away. Phil Hill year. passed away not too long ago, but it's also the 50th anniversary of his uh, championship season. Mm -hmm. He's the world's, America's first world champion. And we've got a lot of the cars that he drove. Um, for Ferrari GTO, B nice, beautiful blue Ferrari GTO, a, a gigantic white Ferrari 375 Mille Emilia, and an impossibly red Ferrari Testarossa. All cars that Phil Hill had considerable racing success with, and all that are so much more valuable for him having ridden in them, mm -hmm. driven them. And, and a Chaparral Can-Am car, too. Way and we've got a back. Chaparral Can-Am way, way in the back. And I guess, you know, I'd forgotten that Phil Hill had driven for Chaparral, too. He did, he did. Uh, one of his last races was in a, in, actually, the very last race was in a was in the Chaparral. And uh, Chaparral is so notable as if you could just picture that giant wing on the back. Mm -hmm. it, 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 movable wing, movable right? Movable wing. It generated lots of downpours that enabled him to go around the corners really, really quickly where other people were sliding around. He was sticking to the road. Yeah, yeah, because they used that wing as an air brake, not, not just for downforce, but as an air brake going right. into had air, And you had a supplemental air brake in the front, too, that was operated with your feet. Mm -hmm. And we, here we're walking into an area tagged supercars, and of course, that's so LA as well. This is LA. Uh, you, you, there's no way you're going to approach the. You're going to be able to use a supercar the way it's designed to be used. But just the fact that people, you look like you can do that is enough for <laughs> right. enough for a lot of people. And we define supercars as anything that's too much. It's just got too much power. It's got too much style. It's way too expensive. It's it's it, it just it embodies every ideal of an automobile. And, and the fact that you never see them are very unusual. Uh, that they're very unusual is is makes them all the more desirable. You got all kinds of things here: Lamborghini Miura, Pantera, De Tomaso Pantera, uh, a Countach, Lamborghini, all kinds of Mercedes and Porsches. Who owns these cars? Does the museum, or do you get them on loan? Well, the museum owns quite a few of these cars, but the rest are on loan from private collectors mm -hmm. in the area. What do you do, do you, uh, in in terms of the cars? Do you sell them eventually or I mean I, I imagine it's got to be real hard to determine what you want to buy what you want to keep what you want to sell what you want to borrow yeah, it's actually not that difficult because we have a we have a list of you know, hot things we'd like we'd like to get should they become available you know under the right circumstances um, but we don't we take donations we're a 501c3 nonprofit so people give us a vehicle they can take it off their tax returns uh -huh. and it's, it works for everybody uh -huh. um, 
and we've been getting some wonderful gifts that way, just some marvelous gifts. And Mr. and Mrs. Peterson have been incredibly generous uh -huh. with us. And Mr. Peterson, during his lifetime, acquired 120, 130 cars, and including including this marvelous Mercedes. So, and just real quickly. Who was Mr. Peterson and why did he do the museum? Mr. Peterson founded Hot Rod Magazine. He founded Motor Trend Magazine. Built a whole publishing he empire. He built a publishing empire. He was, he was a local guy and he, he wanted to give back. He wanted to celebrate the automobile, celebrate automotive culture that, that he actually helped create. Uh -huh. That's great. Well, we got to wrap uh, this segment of the show up, Leslie, but uh, I want you to come back when we do the rapid fire segment where we take questions from the audience. So don't disappear. Well, I'd love we're, to. We're going to need you here in a minute, but right now we've got to take a commercial break. The Chevrolet Cruze is the car that is taking the world by storm. And a key reason is all the equipment that it offers. A driver information center, a USB port, ambient LED backlighting on the dashboard, remote start with a MyLink app, two accessory power outlets, one in front and one in the back for the rear passengers, OnStar turn-by-turn -turn directions free for the first six months. Whew, there's just too much to list here. And you can check it all out at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. Look at this. Bridgestone's using natural rubber, researching ways to enhance its quality and performance, and making their factories more environmentally friendly. Producing products that save on fuel and emissions, and some that can be reused again. And promoting eco-friendly and safety driving campaigns. One team, one planet. Bridgestone. Hyundai is known for the great value that it offers, but let's not forget about the technology. The Hyundai Sonata is the first vehicle in its segment with standard integrated Bluetooth hands-free phone. It's the first vehicle in its segment with factory installed HD radio technology with multicasting. And it's the first vehicle in its segment with XM nav traffic and XM data services. That plus NHTSA's five-star overall crash test rating and the IIHS top safety pick Explain why the Sonata is selling so well. And you can check it all out at HyundaiSonata.com. Museum, looking once again at the 1934 Edsel Ford Roadster. Joining me right now is John Kleiner, formerly of Ford Motor Company, right? You're retired now, well, or what yeah, do we, so how do we describe I, you? Well, I'm sort of a, I guess you call it a Ford lifer. I was with Ford for a little over 38 years, retired January 1st, came back to work January 3rd on contract in the same office. So I, I just love Ford, and I'm so excited that this car is still here to talk a bit about it. And I know they want to haul this away to the LA Auto Show, so let's talk yeah. a little bit about this in more detail. And then let's sit down and chat about some other things. Terrific. But what a stunning looking car. It's incredible. Edsel Ford, the original Edsel Ford, the son of Henry Ford, was an artist. His, his talents were in art and photography. He traveled to Europe a great deal. His European tastes were very much reflected in this car. This is a car that he commissioned Bob Gregory, E.T. Bob Gregory, to, to lead the design of. It is an aluminum body. The interesting thing, these fenders are in fact modified from Ford Trimotor fenders. It was built in the Ford Trimotor plant in Michigan. Again, aluminum, same material they used to make the Trimotor aircraft. This is a car that he designed 
thinking, I'd like to produce this sort of car. It never came to pass. Too bad it didn't, but it's just recently been restored to its former glory, as we see here. Edsel Ford II found the car. It actually belongs to the Edsel and Eleanor Ford house in Gross Point, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Which and is even worth talking about in itself, because oh. that house is a, a beautiful, almost English kind of cottage That's on right. a grand scale, because it is kind of a mansion, really. Yeah, Cotswold, English, but, yes. but again, it reflects Edsel's tastes. Exactly. Whereas if you go to Henry Ford's, his father's house, it's kind of English castle-like, and right. it's, I, I don't know, it's its not inviting, whereas Edsel's house, yeah. boy, you, you just want to go in and be there. because He it's, had the design flair, no right. question about it, and Edsel II has been the, the catalyst in, in bringing back a full collection of cars that Edsel I either designed and or owned to celebrate his grandfather's actually very prominent role in Ford Motor Company design. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. Edsel, even though you describe him as uh, an artist and the like, he was a real car guy. I oh, mean, absolutely. he understood car design and especially the aesthetics part of it. He bought the Edsel Ford the first bought the first MG ever sold in America. That's yeah, amazing. I never yeah, knew that. Yeah, I never yeah. knew that. And he had a Bugatti in, in which they designed a custom golf bag carrier. So he, he loved cars <laughs> from you know the other side of the pond, and it was reflected in some of the car. And, and I guess uh, an Edsel Ford could get away with buying Bugattis and MGs and things like that, yes, whereas yes. it might be frowned on to these days. Well, uh, to their credit, the Ford family, they appreciate great cars. Mm -hmm. And that's good because, you know, lots of people make different great cars, and to have an awareness of what's out there is very helpful for Ford Motor Company. So. Well, come on, walk with me. Let's go through sure. the... We're gonna watch the gonna oh, okay. Sure. They're, they're telling me right now that they're actually going to fire this thing up and move it out of here. So, uh, we'll listen to that. Not how many people have witnessed this? I, I, I've never witnessed But this car was unveiled at uh, Pebble Beach. And, and look how hard it is to climb into this thing. I mean, the steering wheel is so close to the seat. It's so awkward to get in there. Precious cars. He moves Ford concept cars all over the world, and for the really special ones like this, he personally is the one who does it. So it's he's. I told him he should write a book someday. You really should. He's Get pictures of everything. Sure. Uh, no doubt about it. And then to have to ship those cars around the world because they're like styling reviews and exactly. different parts cars of Ford. Shows and uh -huh. yeah, yeah, concept well, cars, that sort of thing. Well, yes. let's go back inside the museum here. Okay. 
you know, out of the lobby area where we've got all kinds of people. But one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is you started something that is, or helped start Cars and Coffee. Well, yes, I guess I, I helped continue something is probably okay. the best way to put it. Uh, and Freeman Thomas, for design chief in Irvine, uh, deserves equal credit for that. Uh -huh. um, cars and Coffee, yes. It's Which is a very to... L.A. thing. Well, it is, yeah. In fact, it's interesting, this, this tour you've had of the museum here, talking about the car culture in L.A., it said, it can be argued forever, but it said that Detroit is the auto industry capital, L.A. is the auto enthusiast capital. Yeah. And that, or I would uh, even just say it's, it's the center of the universe of automotive culture. Well, Yep, a lot of people would agree with that, certainly. Yeah, and, and that's a Detroit guy saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, I'm a Detroit guy as well, and and uh, I was very fortunate. But you spent your whole, most of your career out here, Well, right? a good half of it. I moved here in 1988 on a two-year assignment, and here I am. So, uh, but, uh, and I was actually here for the opening of the Peterson Museum, which was you know, a great privilege. I, at the time, I didn't dream I would still be here and able to have this walkthrough today. But uh, Cars and Coffee is, I guess is a, a, if anything, it's a California thing, but it has now spread all around the world, the concept, and it's simply a, an impromptu, calendarized get-together of car enthusiasts with interesting cars. And by calendarized, you mean it's, Saturday it's, morning? Yes, in our case, it's every Saturday. There are cars and car events in other parts of the world which have simply copied our idea. We're in no way affiliated with them. Um, on behalf of Ford Motor Company, I host with my, my wife, the Saturday morning Irvine Cars and Coffee. Um, we get 400 to 600 cars every Saturday. That's amazing. And, and the turnover is only, I will tell you, I see at least 40 cars every Saturday that I've never seen before. That's so it's just, yeah, and this has been going on for now a little over five years. So, so the whole idea is get a cup of coffee and walk around the parking lot right, and look at these cars. Right, right. Here, have a seat and cheer. Sure. Let's take a load sure. off of our minds here. Right, great. So actually, in about 2003, two fellows copied an idea that's been going for about 20 years in Huntington Beach called Donut Derelicts, uh -huh. which... Another very L.A. kind yes, of a thing. And Donut Derelicts, that's the real hardcore guys. They get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. They're on site at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you show up at 6 a.m., they say, hey, good afternoon. But this is a group of, of mostly hot rodders, such as this hot rod shop we're in here. Um, some fellows who lived in Newport Beach said, oh, it's a long way to drive. We don't want to get up quite that early. Let's start something ourselves. So in, in 2003, they started their own informal gathering at a strip mall, funny thing, strip mall, called Crystal Cove. It's, in, it's just south of Newport Beach. And it was a low-key, strictly word-of-mouth thing. And 50 cars came, and 80 cars came, and before you know it, it was 150 cars. And that was okay. It was continuable. But then, instantly, the Orange County Register ran a newspaper article about it in 2005, and the world came. Suddenly, it was discovered. And they were just inundated, so the property owners reluctantly said, you got to go somewhere else, we just can't handle this. Freeman Thomas and I happened to be on hand that day, and we thought, well, we've got a spot. So in fact, we invited Dan Gurney, Reeves Cowley, Barry McGuire, a few other fellows who were there to come over and look at the Ford parking lot in, in Irvine, in our building. And uh, it's actually the lot to share between Ford and Mazda, and Mazda gets kudos for agreeing with us as well. Um, so we invited people to come over, actually print up flyers, and said, okay, guys, you got to go somewhere, we've got the somewhere, come over to, to Irvine. And the first Saturday, which was in October, late October 2006, we had a little over 300 cars show up, and it's just never stopped from that day forward. So it's a word of mouth thing. We don't have a website. We try to keep it pretty low key, because if we, if we allowed, for example, newspaper locally to cover it, we'd have the same problem. And with all the local media, they will not cover it. Is that right? Yep, they're very good. They can come. We have Chris Witter from USA Today, we have writers from LA Times, we have reporters from local TV come. And what they'll do is pick individuals and do stories about those individuals. But the agreement is you'll never mention Irvine, you'll never mention Cars and Coffee. Just keep it, help us keep it under the radar. And even with that effort, we still get some Saturdays where people are lined up, and we have room for maximum 600 cars on the property, and we'll fill it with that. And no. plus we have spectator cars, so we get 2,000 people there uh -huh. every Saturday. We tell people, this event is about cars you won't see the other six days of the week. <laughs> that's, that's the criteria. So, you know, if you're driving a you know, new BMW with tinted windows, that's nice, but please go park in spectator. We want cars that really make people want to get out of bed and see in the morning. 
So it's anything that's exotic, nostalgic, whimsical, bizarre. We had the Death Mobile from Animal House show up recently. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> and and uh, Ford Motor Company has uh, supported this. And much to his credit, Ray Day, our vice president, he said, yep, I like this idea. We will pay to have the Irvine Police Department on hand. And Even that allows us to do it. Most of the cars are not Fords. True. It's, it's everything. We, lots of Fords are there, but lots of everything is there. Uh, it's unbelievable. So kudos and, to Ford to support stuff that absolutely. is the actually supporting absolutely. competing the, brands. And I'll say, yeah. And, and our thought is, you know, we're car people. And anybody who is car people, you know, will, will come to this. And yeah, through us, most of them are going to say, you know, we like Ford. In fact, I had an instance not too long ago where a man was driving out in his 911 Porsche. I said, thanks for coming. He said, you know, I got to tell you, my daughter is in college. I was going to buy her Toyota. I canceled the order and bought her a Ford. I appreciate her doing this. So that was, that was that great. Paid yep, off. That, that's okay. But uh, back to the Irvine police, when the Mobile drove in. This is that wacky car from Animal House. Has a chariot. It's a modified old Lincoln. The, the uh, motorcycle cop just looked at the thing and just shook his head. Uh, <laughs> let him go. <laughs> so, so there's a great. In fact, the police are. There's a waiting list for them wanting to come and do this duty because it's not part duty. You just, you know, the main thing is for them. Just by being there, it, it means that people will be careful in departing. Uh, pedestrian safety is our main concern. And because you have a lot of high performance cars that show oh, up for this, and everybody absolutely. would just like to blow out of there. Right. Sure. There's a natural. But it doesn't happen, and we've now been a little over five years with complete harmony and success. And, and again, our neighbors at Mazda are, are very supportive of it, and this is just a good time. So when people just show up, or, or do you invite cars to be there, or how do you determine what goes in the public viewing area as right. opposed to the public well, parking area? The, the small lot that is is assigned to the design center as opposed to the main lot, the small lot holds about 50 cars, and that we call our featured mark lot, and for time, about once a month we will feature something, and the way that happens is, for example, a club president for the Porsche Club or whatever, they will call me and say, can I have such and such a date? Except, yeah, fine, and the agreement is that they don't tell anybody. They just tell the guys who are bringing cars because, again, we want it to all be low-key for, for total attendance as well as we want it to be a complete surprise. So every Saturday, people keep coming back and again and again because every Saturday is something new. So it, it's just the surprise factor of it is, is really good. So it's, the formula has worked very well um, by keeping it low-key, by not having a website, honestly, by having police presence. Those are the, the, the key things. I've received calls from people from all over the world saying, how do you do it? And those are the things I tell them. You have to do this. And having a corporate venue, which Ford has, has kindly provided, sure helps as well. Uh -huh. uh, where we are is away from population areas. There is a, there's no residential presence. There's an interstate right beside it. So it makes it a nice uh, spot for doing all of this. So. Clearly, you're a car guy. What do you have? Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, I love your, your response. <laughs> it's almost one of melancholy. Now I have to explain it all. Well, the main thing I have is a very supportive wife, Linda. In fact, uh, we call her the Walmart greeter for Cars and Coffee. She's there every Saturday with me and with her school teacher demeanor. She's very good at saying, you know, no, your car should go over and inspect her. Oh, okay, you know, I'll go park and inspect her. Um, she, she and I went to a racing driver school on our honeymoon. She's a car woman, All car guy. Right. You married well. So um, in 1976, when she was a school teacher in Plymouth, Michigan, and I was working for Ford, my annual salary is $14,000. Her annual salary is $13,000. A friend of ours offered us a 1958 Ferrari 250 Cabriolet, Series 1 Cabriolet, for $13,000. So, gosh, are we going to spend your entire annual income? Yeah, let's do it. We had no children, no, you know, so forth. So, you were young. That's right. And what so a we bought, steal! So we bought a 250 the, Ferrari for thirteen thousand dollars. That was all the money in 1976. <laughs> and fortunately, we still have the car. So yeah. Wow. So, so it's. Uh, How cool is uh, that? It's, and it runs great and everything. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it runs great. Yeah. And in fact, actually, at the moment, it's in the Ford Design Studio in Irvine as one of the reference vehicles being looked at for a new Ford product that they're developing. So that's kind of cool. Wait so, a minute, so. wait a minute. <laughs> I love this story. Well, in fact, at that studio, it's interesting, uh, on, on one of the benefits of Cars and Coffee, for example, the Ford Start concept car that Freeman and his staff developed. It's a beautiful, just endearing, roundish little car, concept car. It was debuted at the Beijing Auto Show. Um, 
Freeman had for reference three cars from Cars and Coffee attendees, a 61 Alfa Romeo Giulietta Sprint Zagato, a Deutsche Bonnet, a French car, and a 57 Porsche Speedster. All of those had that roundish theme uh -huh. to them, uh -huh. and they were used as reference cars. So Freeman has, from Cars and Coffee, just an endless supply of reference vehicles that he can bring in to, to help with the, with the process. So it's, it works very nicely. That's pretty cool, and it's got to really mean something for the owner of those cars to be tapped on the shoulder by Freeman yes. Thomas and say, you know, I'd like to put that in my studio for right. a while. Right. That's exactly. got to be one of the coolest things to happen. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, uh, and just the, the goodwill and the, you know, car people is the great equalizer. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old, if you love cars, you love cars and you kind of love each other. And that's, that's the dynamic that we have every Saturday morning with people bringing everything from brand new Bugatti like the supercar exhibit we saw upstairs. Last week I was allowed to drive for the first time Call it a real Fiat 500, 1969 Fiat 500, two cylinder, 17 horsepower. I had a ball driving a thing around. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't matter. Everybody with something interesting is welcome. That's right. You know, it, that's what I love about cars is whether it's some of the big monsters that we saw outside or a little right. Cinquecento, a two cylinder. It's fun to drive. Exactly. You, you, you look at a car like that and you go, man, I want to get in there. I want to experience it. Three weeks ago, to everyone's amazement, none of us knew the car was coming. Then came a 50s era Mercedes-Benz tow truck, as you would find on the Autobahn, with all the German license plate and everything. And again, the police are good at looking the other way. If cars are authentic, that's fine. Well, he was carrying an 1897 Benz, a one-cylinder, ka chunk ka chunk you know, this thing, in perfect condition. He rolled in, tilted the thing out, rolled this one-cylinder 1897 Benz off and drove it around the lot for people to see. You know, it's just amazing. So every, every Saturday, we have an array of cars that would merit an annual spot on the calendar most anywhere else. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, and it's amazing that so many people own these vehicles in the LA area. Right, and we have we have quite a number of, while we discourage local publicity because of crowd, we are we welcome, for example, like we're doing now for people in Detroit to know about it, and internationally, we've had two occasions where tour buses have brought people. Uh, one was a group from, um, from Norway, They'd been to the SEMA show. They said, let's go over to Cars and Coffee. A bus came up and unloaded 40 people, 40 Norwegians, to walk around. They had heard about it. And another case, we had a group of Japanese and, and uh, Thai visitors. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and a great, uh, just a great um, celebration of the automobile that people share. And every single week, right? Yes, or just about every no, single we week. Were there last year. It happened that a Saturday fell on Christmas morning and New Year's morning. We were there and lots of other people were there. So it's every Saturday. That's even more you know, amazing. We've created this momentum that can't be stopped. So yeah. there you are. Good for you so. guys. Hey, let's do the rapid fire segment of the show right now. Let's get Leslie back in here. Though we've got to monkey around with the microphones a little bit. And so give us a right. second here. Sure. But Leslie, come on. Take a seat and uh, okay, sure. Very good. So usually we run this graphic and this this whole soundtrack for rapid fire. We can't do that with the technology that we're using to strive to stream here live from the Peterson Museum. So we just start rapid fire. Uh, first question is uh, from Miss Motormouth. She wants to know, John, are the pony car wars over? And if not, how many more horsepower can they legally add? Does anyone need 650 horsepower, which of course is a reference to the, the Shelby the GT500 Shelby. that was just unveiled at the LA Auto Show. 650 horsepower, 200 mile an hour capability, and yet it is not hit with the gas guzzler tax, which I find extraordinary. It's amazing, it is amazing. Well, does anyone need 650 horsepower? Um, with many cars that are on the road today, certainly the LA Auto Show, do you need the car? Well, but do you want the car? Yeah. Sure, people want it. Does anyone need it? Well, it, 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 it works very well in the chassis where it is applied. We wouldn't put 650 horsepower in, in the new Escape, but certainly on this Mustang, the Shelby, yes. Um, it's, um, again, I, I would call it part of the celebration of the automobile. There are all kinds of cars, you know, a few feet away from that Mustang is a Focus EV. 
So there's everything for everybody, and you know that's the wonderful thing about cars. Think about the invention of the automobile, the freedom that it gives in every sense of the word that our ancestors just didn't have. They were in that blacksmith shop back there, you know, shoeing a horse. That's right. And talk about emissions, by the way. So, uh, you know, sure, we need 650 horsepower. Are the pony car wars over? Oh, certainly not. Yeah. Certainly not. I, and, I, you know, I read it the exact same way. Okay, you're going to have to pass the microphone to, to Leslie because right. Mitch W. wants to know, in a nutshell, what's the mission statement for the Peterson? Real easy. It's uh, The Peterson Museum exists to explore and present the history of the automobile and its impact on American life and culture using Los Angeles as its prime example. That's great, and you must get visitors from all over the world, though, we even get, though it's for Los Angeles. Well, we, we're so we're LA centric, but that means that we're very ecumenical. We get an awful lot of people here. We cover everything. Uh, it's because LA is so accepting of car culture. So much happens here that's interesting, and we get to talk about all of it. And I imagine you've got a whole lot more that's just not on an exhibit right now. You must have a pile of other cars and components and whatnot, too. We, we have a number of cars that are in our reserve collection uh, that, that we keep in the vault. But, you know, we also go into the community. Uh, um, you know, people that might come to Cars and Coffee, people that might go to other car shows and friends that we've made over the years. Uh, if we need a car, they'll loan it to us for a, a temporarily for an exhibition. Okay, Jim wants to know, how is the Peterson funded and how many people visit a year on average? We get about 150, 160,000 people a year. Uh, we have active school bus program. We get a lot of students here, we, uh, some researchers even. Uh, the Peterson Museum is funded in, in many ways, but um, uh, primarily through admissions. We, we offer special events. Uh, the Peterson Museum is a special event space. Uh, and we do accept donations. <laughs> we're, 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 are you listening, people? Are you listening out there in the audience? <laughs> we are a 501c3, and I would like to point that out. We're tax always deductible. Tax deductible. You donate, okay. we're, we're always looking for, for interesting things, and we love it when people tell us what they have. Uh, Jesse W. Henry says, I wonder how many of those Cushmans are in barns in France and Germany. I wonder too. I'd love to find that. Um, but you know, one thing about those little scooters is you can put them in a corner and just forget about it because they're so small. You can stash them away. It's not like a gigantic car that you're going to keep tripping over. It's easy to forget about a Cushman. So I'm sure in some you know some French barn there's there's probably quite a few. Okay, Jay Cujo says, why does Peter not join you on the West Coast? Have they barred him from California because of his rants? That's exactly it. There's big signs at the airport with his picture on it with the X's through them. No, I'm just joking. No, Peter wasn't able to make it out for this trip. Uh, but So there you go, Jay Cujo. That's what happened there. Um, let's see. Tony Gray says, I wonder how often they exercise those museum cars. Well, we try to exercise cars pretty regularly. Six to eight weeks is a good is a good amount of time between. Really, everything that we walked rides. around, you start them up and run. Yeah, yeah. Some cars are set. Not everything. Some cars are set up for long term exhibition, which means we drain fluids and we we put them on jack stands and things like that. Not to take away from the from the visitors' experience, but just to preserve the the machine. But if it runs. When we get it, it stays running. But uh, just uh, to mention, uh, quite a lot of car shows, Concord Elegance events and others, the Peterson Museum, thanks very much to Leslie, is uh, a, a regular participant in these events, and their cars add a great deal to, again, the love affair with the automobile there in California. Well, think about it, because, you know, we talked about uh, the Edsel... Uh, the Speedster? The, the Speedster. Yeah. It's one thing to talk about it, but when he started it up and it started rolling, it's like, wow. Right. It's, that, you know, again, I get that, that urge. I want to be in that car. I want to go. So to have them out at concours or parades or things like that is fantastic because the public will then appreciate those cars on a different level. Yes, it's living history. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Let's see here. Uh, Mike Dwight says, speaking of car of the year, what's with the Passat being Motor Trend's car of the year? I don't know. You're going to have to ask Motor Trend about that. I didn't have any vote on that. I'm voting on the North American car and truck of the year. We'll announce that at the Detroit Auto Show in, in January. Let's see. A uh, comment from Carl from Fairfax. He says, Ford's been vague about the timing of the Focus ST US launch. Rumors said as early as this fall. Well, we're past the fall, I mean. Now Ford says coming late 2012, 
John, what can you tell us uh, about the timing of when the ST hits the market here in the U.S.? Uh, we have it on display at the L.A. Auto Show. Uh, the timing, I am not aware of, uh, honestly, what, what that is. Uh, but it, obviously, the car does now exist, and it's on the way, so stay tuned. Okay, Carl wants to know, too, it sounds like Europe's going to get the goods before we do. Well, that's often been the case, but the great thing is we are getting the goods. There was a time not long ago when we just didn't. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, these cars being developed in Europe, yes, they're introduced there, but they're coming here with, in many cases, essentially no no differenti differentiation, and that's a big plus for you know. You compare, for example, years back, people would go to Europe and drive cars, and you know, oh, I had just got this great car from Hertz, and I can't get it in the U.S. Those days are disappearing now. We truly do have the same goodies on both sides of the ocean, which is terrific. Well, and kudos to Ford for the one Ford kind of Absolutely. way of approaching things because that's yes. what makes it possible. That's right. And also at the LA show, they showed a Fiesta ST. Is yes. it, that's a little bit of that, a surprise because we've yeah. been hearing about the Focus ST yeah, that is, It is a concept, but it's not an idle concept. No, it sure looks production ready to yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, here's an interesting thing. Elmer says, I wonder how much more uh, body with fancy sheet metal costs compared to a simple one. Uh, he says, how many machines does it take to stamp a Sonata's door compared to a Corolla's? And how much more in dollar terms would that cost per door? You know, that's, that's pretty interesting. Actually, as I've always said, it costs no more money to stamp out a beautiful body than an ugly one. And if you compare stampings to a Sonata, and a Corolla, I'll bet they're very, very similar. Now, when you want to start in talking in terms of depth of draw, like if you look at the rear three-quarter on today's Camaro, that's a very deep draw steel. So that's probably about a, a five die set draw, I would guess. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas when you get into things like the Corolla and the Sonata, that's probably going to be four hits per panel, in some case three hits per panel. Right. So there can be some differences, but generally speaking, what I said is costs no more to design a beautiful body than an ugly one. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And uh, let's see what else we've got here from the audience. Uh, and, you know, this is true. They're, they're just coming in, so I'm reading them cold here. I, I haven't pre-read these things. Uh, let's see. Al uh, Jadzik says, over the last couple of weeks, Chevrolet has announced the new Colorado and Trailblazer. I understand the Colorado is being planned for the U.S. market and that possibly it will be built in Wentzville, Missouri. The word on the Trailblazer is that it will not be built for the U.S. market. What gives? Well, what gives is it's kind of like Ford with the Ranger, right? You have uh, the Ford Ranger sold very different truck than what we see in the U.S. market sold right. elsewhere right. in the world will not be sold here. Why? Because you've got the F-Series trucks to take care of that. And I know people don't accept that the Ranger pickup really competes with the F-Series, but it would be kind of awkward, I guess, for Ford to put both in the showroom. Well, when you look at the fuel economy now achievable with the F-Series, the, the difference that used to exist isn't there anymore. So it broadens the, the reach, you might say, of the F-Series. And I guess... I'm guessing it's the same sort of thing with the Trailblazer. It's built for an international market, not so much for the U.S. market. And Chevrolet is going to have a number of products that are close enough that they don't mm -hmm. want to bring this international Trailblazer here. That's yeah. what I'm imagining it is. Yeah. Well, look, we've, we've got a, a whole lot of other questions here, but we're also uh, at the top of the hour of the show. so. I think it's time to wrap it up, but John Kleiner from yeah. Ford, thanks so much for coming on, oh, especially you. talking about cars and coffee. Well, I want to say I, I've been a, a viewer of AutoLine most every Thursday, and it's a real treat to be on this side of the camera. Thank you very much. It's just, you do a great job. It's a terrific program. Yeah, and uh, Leslie Kendall, thanks so much for letting us in your museum here. It's just awesome. John, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming, and I, I want to echo John's sentiments. It's well, wonderful to be on your show. Well, we got to come back because, uh, you know, we didn't even hit the highlights. I mean, we, we, we barely skimmed them. There's, there's a, so much more to see in this there's museum. There's an awful lot more to see, and anybody can see at any time, Corner, Wilshire, and Fairfax, Fair, <laughs> Fairfax Peterson.org. <laughs> right. And remember, no Owen Peterson. E-N. Yeah. <laughs> E-N. E there you go. Well, uh, time for me to wrap this up here, folks. But uh, remember, it's 
you can always catch the show at autoline.tv you can always follow us at twitter on twitter twitter.com slash autoline remember check out peter de lorenzo's auto extremist column at autoextremist.com all his rants and everything else he covers there at twitter.com slash autoextremist and he like us is also available on facebook you can check it all out there but thanks so much for having joined us it's great to be in la and going through this museum with two hardcore car guys auto line after hours is brought to you by bridgestone your journey our passion chevrolet the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com.